This is a 2002 Hyundai Equus. If you know cars, you already know the Equus. It's Hyundai's flagship luxury sedan designed to take on Mercedes-Benz and Cadillac and Lexus. But you also know that the Equus came out recently in 2011. Well, that was just in the United States. In fact, Hyundai's been making the Equus for 20 years, and this is an ultra-rare first-generation Equus that was never sold outside Asia. Today, I'm going to take you on a tour of the flagship Hyundai luxury sedan you never knew existed until now. Today, I'm going to take you on a tour of the first-generation Hyundai Equus, and I'm going to show you Korea's original answer to the Lexus LS and the Mercedes S-Class. Now, like I said, this car was only sold in Korea, and most people I talked to, even serious car enthusiasts, had no idea there was a first-generation Hyundai Equus before the one we got in the United States. But here it is. In fact, I think this is the only English-speaking video in existence about this car. So how did I find it? I borrowed this car from my friend Miguel, who works at Tomini Classics here in Dubai in the United Arab Emirates. Now, Tomini Classics has an incredible inventory of exotics and classics, and you've seen a lot of their cars in my videos over the last couple of months. And their sales staff, well, one of them drives a Lancia Fulvia, and the other one drives this, probably one of just a handful of these in the entire Middle East. Those are the cars of true car enthusiasts. So first I'm going to show you around the Equus, and I'm going to show you its unusual quirks and features, and then I'm going to get it out on the road and find out how 15-year-old Korean luxury drives, and then I'm going to give it a Doug score. And for more of my thoughts on the Equus, click the link below to go to autotrader.com slash oversteer, where I've written a column about it, and I've also compiled a list of the most interesting Hyundai models currently listed for sale on Autotrader. Now, I'm going to start this tour on the inside, and specifically in the back, because this is the place to be in this car. After all, you were supposed to be chauffeured around in one of these, like the wealthy, successful Korean businessman you were in 2002. In fact, Hyundai even made a limo version of this car, although I think after this tour you'll agree that the limo is a little redundant. You don't really need all those features. This car has more than enough. I will start on the door panel. The door panel isn't that unusual, but it has a couple of interesting things. For example, it has a nice sunshade you can put up so you can block yourself from the sun. It also has an ashtray here and a cigarette lighter. In fact, the Equus has three cigarette lighters, one for the two people up front, they barely matter, and two for each individual rear passenger. It's also worth noting that the rear door is absolutely gigantic. It's incredibly long because this car has a lot of legroom, and when you open it, there's no question what type of vehicle you're in because Equus is emblazoned on the door sill. Equus is also emblazoned on the floor mat once you get inside and sit down. And when you sit down in the back of the Equus, you will find one of the coolest luxury car features I have ever seen. I'm going to show it to you now. Now, there are a lot of controls back here for all sorts of things. I'll show those to you in a minute, but there's no control to move the front passenger seat forward. Basically, you're sitting back here and you want more legroom. There's no button you press to move it forward to give you more legroom. That's pretty common standard fare in an S-Class, and I was surprised that it wasn't in this car until I discovered this. This, you can pull the middle out of the front passenger seat, creating sort of an unbroken line of leather, which allows you to do this. <laughs> That's right, you can lie down the back of an Equus if you want with your feet on the front seat. That is the intent of this thing. After I discovered this, I realized who needs a Mercedes S-Class where you can move the front passenger seat forward and get four extra inches. I can lie down in this thing as I'm being chauffeured on the streets of Korea. I'm not sure if anybody has ever actually used this feature, but I got to admit, it is pretty comfortable. This is kind of a nice feeling. Now, this feature is very famous on the Toyota Century, Toyota's Japan-only flagship car but the Equus has it too. Now, in some of those shots, you probably saw the rear TV back here, so I guess I'll show it to you now. Yes, there is a rear TV in this car, and yes, it is a TV. Really, it's sort of an infotainment screen. You can see various functions, like what's playing on the radio, what CD you're listening to, but you can also tune it to the TV. Now, the owner of this car, Miguel, he told me that the TV doesn't work outside Korea, which is a real shame, because I'm very comfortable right now, and I could really go for some Gilmore Girls on the rear TV in the Hyundai Equus. 
quests. Anyway, to control the rear TV, you flip up this little lid in the center console, and you have all the controls. You get mute, mode, seek, power, volume, and you'll notice that on the control pad for the TV, you'll see another Equus logo. And speaking of what's underneath this rear lid, that brings us to yet another Equus rear seat benefit. These seats are power operated. Even though this is a rear bench, if I push the button, oh yeah, oh that's even nicer. Mm -hmm. Or I can move it back, forward. Both sides move. This side moves with the entire center, so the center console always stays within reach. That side moves by itself, but either way, you can move both seats for the ultimate luxury seating position when you're sitting back here with your feet on the front passenger seat watching the television. Anyway, on to some more rear seat stuff. Like in most luxury cars with big back seats, this car has little fold-down mirrors that come from the ceiling. They're lighted so that you can look at yourself. Additionally, beyond those mirrors, this car also has map lights, press a little button, the light turns on. That's pretty standard. What isn't standard and what might just be my favorite Equus feature, even more than this front seat thing, is the mood button. There is a button in the dome light cluster that says mood. Push it and the lights turn green. <laughs> you push it and three green lights turn on, sort of dim to create a green mood. You can't change the color of those lights, so I hope that your mood is green. So basically, you can choose between map lights or green mood lighting if you're in the back of an Equus. I think that is hilarious. Now, closing up this little part of the center console and opening this one, you'll find a couple things. There are two little storage compartments, and also you will find the rear heated seat dials. You can dial them from one all the way to five to find your optimal heated seat setting. There's also a little red, yellow, white jack back here so you can hook up your video game console or your VCR and you can watch on the TV or play games while you're driven. This would have been the most wonderful experience in Korea back in 2002. So that's a tour of the rear. Now it's time to move on to the front and maybe my favorite thing about the entire front of this car, that would be the ridiculously outdated center screen. This screen is about the same size as the TV screen in back and yes, it can also be operated as a TV. So you could have been watching TV as you were driving down the road in this car and the person in back could have also been watching TV. But it's much more useful in various other functions. My personal favorite is when you press trip, you see these various little trip displays, like for example, your average speed or the time you've been driving, the distance you've been traveling, except most of it is in Korean. Still, you get a pretty good idea of what's going on. It just looks really, really old. Also, please take a look at the graphic that comes on the screen every time you start the car. If that doesn't say 1990s computer game that you've completely forgotten about and played in the bottom of your computer desk, then I don't know what does. Now, neither of those things are my favorite thing about the center screen. My favorite thing about the center screen would have to be the stereo positioning. There are two buttons on the stereo with which you can control the stereo positioning. One says pause, POS for position, the other says SFLD. I have no idea what that means. Now, the pause button is especially interesting because when you push it, you move the positioning of the sound around the interior. And as you push it, you can see it go from speaker to speaker. There's a zone on the driver's side, a zone on the passenger side, and a zone for the entire rear. So the CEO or the politician you're driving around can have the sound back there at its perfectly desired level. You can see the graphical representation of that in two places. One is on the radio screen itself, which is kind of cool because the radio screen is really small, and yet as you push it, there it goes moving around the car. Obviously, you can also see it on the center screen moving from place to place in the car exactly where you want the radio. Interestingly, when you have it in the setting for all speakers, it kind of looks like someone drew a little smiley face on the top of a car. But folks, pause has nothing on SFLD. Again, I have no idea what it means, but when you push it, it gives you four different options for how you want the car to sound. Hall, church, stadium, or club. You can choose between those four options. And again, it shows on the screen and it also shows on the radio. Now the radio itself has a very tiny screen and yet they've devoted significant real estate on that screen to hall, church, stadium, and club. This is one of the most bizarre descriptions of sound I've ever heard. Who gets in their car and says, boy, I really want it to sound like a church today. Also, do you really think it changes that much between hall, church, stadium, and club? What's the difference between a hall and a church? And is it possible to have a car stereo <laughs> sound like a stadium? It's one of the most bizarre things I've ever seen, yet the Hyundai Equus has the option so that the CEO and back can shout to the driver, I want church today. 
Also worth noting with the center screen, when you change the volume in this car, it doesn't just get louder or softer inside the car. Instead, it shows you this really old school looking volume graph on the screen itself so that you know how loud it is. Now that's all for the weirdness in the center screen, but the weirdness in the front of this car does not end there, not even close. Here's another bizarre feature. This car has tri-zone automatic climate control. So one zone here, one zone here, and one zone for the rear. And there's a button up front that's labeled triple zone automatic air conditioning, except that actually isn't a button. I think it's just an advertisement for the fact that it has that feature. You push that and nothing happens. Instead, to turn on the rear air conditioning, there is a separate button up front labeled RR, press it and the rear air conditioning turns on. Press it again when the executive in back asks you to, and it turns back off. And speaking of buttons that control stuff in the rear, here's a really, really strange one. On the left of the steering wheel, over by the button for the fog light and for the instrument panel light, there is a heated seat button. And what does that heated seat button do? It controls the passenger rear seat only. There's no heated seat button for the driver rear seat, just the passenger one. Now, as you saw before, there were dials back there so the rear passenger could turn on their own heated seat, but of course, if you're being chauffeured around, wouldn't it be easier to just yell to the driver, heat my seat? The driver can do that and continue driving. It's ridiculous. Now, speaking of that area over by the steering wheel, one of the things I really think is cool in this car is the gauge cluster. It may look like a normal 90s, 2000s Japanese Korean gauge cluster at first glance, but if you look closely, it has depths. The warning labels display on one depth and then behind it in basically a separate panel is the speedometer and the tachometer. And then there are more warning labels back behind that. There's basically three different elevations of gauge cluster. It's really cool, especially because when the car is off or at a quick glance, it only really looks like one. But when you look closer, you can see that it really isn't, and it's actually kind of unusual. But that's not the most interesting quirk about the gauge cluster. That would be the fact that this car displays what gear you're in, even when you're in automatic mode. So you're just driving down the street and it tells you what gear you're in, even though nobody who's ever driven an automatic cares what gear they're in. But those little lights are always changing, first, second, third, fifth, third, fourth, as you're driving along down the street. And moving on from the gauge cluster, another one of the things I like about the front of this car is the ashtray. When you tap the lid to open the ashtray, it doesn't just open. Instead, the lid opens and also the ashtray is sort of presented to you. It's pushed out towards you to make it easier to use. Now, another interesting thing in this interior is the number of things that are in English and the number of things that are in Korean. It's this weird hodgepodge. You can see all of the radio buttons are in English and all of the buttons for the center screen are in English. But if you drop the visor, well, there's some Korean writing. I wonder what it tells you. Also, if you look on the passenger side mirror, there's Korean for objects in mirror are closer than they appear. But all of the controls for the TV and back are again in English. So you better be bilingual if you were driving an Equus in 02. Another unusual thing is the center console. Now in virtually every other car, the center console opens up just like this. But in this car, because there's a TV here, so they can't hinge it that way. Instead, it opens this way towards the driver, meaning the passenger has no access to it. And Finally, it's not especially surprising. Every car of this ilk has it, but this car has a rear sunshade. Push this little button down in the center next to the transmission lever and the rear sunshade pops up and back to give the rear passenger a little extra privacy or some refuge from the hot Korean sun. All right, so you've seen the interior. Now it's time to move on to the exterior quirks of the Equus, starting with the styling. Now, folks, I'm gonna be honest here. This is a Korean knockoff of a 1997 Lexus LS 400. I'm serious, doesn't it look like it? This car came out only a couple of years after that one and I don't think I've ever seen a clearer example of an automaker saying, hmm, that looks nice. I'm gonna take that, except for those Chinese knockoff cars that look just like cars sold in America and in Europe. Another interesting note about the styling of this car is it's quite conservative. There's no crazy lines or jagged edges. This was a car for business people, and they kept it very subdued, except for the part where they stole the design from the LS, and also except for the hood ornament. Now, cars today don't have hood ornaments, especially cars from the 90s from Korea, but this one did to remind you that you were driving the ultimate Hyundai. I don't really know what it is. It looks like wings and one single leg, but it's there, always in front of you when you're sitting in the driver's seat. Next up, another thing in the front of this car that I find pretty interesting. Now, this car is the old school approach to luxury. It's not jagged or crazy styling. It's a very plush vehicle, the kind of car you're supposed to be driven around in. And yet, check this out. 
and has LED turn signals. Now, Korea was and is a major producer for LED technology, so it's not surprising that a car like this would use LED turn signals, but this car must have used it before virtually anything. This thing was in 2002. The design came out in 99. No one was using LED turn signals at that time, but the Equus was. Next up, moving around to the back of the Equus, there are a couple of quirks up here. One of them is the reverse lights. Instead of being in this tail light turn signal cluster, they're sort of in the middle underneath the trunk. Take a look. Also interesting back here is the trunk. Number one, simply getting in the trunk. In order to do that, you move aside this little badge that has the same shape as the hood ornament in front. There are no Hyundai badges on this car, just the hood ornament and this emblem in back that looks like the hood ornament. Anyway, move it aside and that's where you'll find the little place to put the key in and you open up the trunk and you'll discover the trunk in this car is massive, truly huge. One of the largest trunks I've seen in any car I've ever reviewed, maybe the single largest. Now inside the trunk, the interesting quirks are twofold. Number one is the emergency fuel door release. It is Velcroed to the side of the trunk liner and if you pull it, it opens up the fuel door just in case the release on the door doesn't work. There is a redundancy for the fuel door release in this vehicle. Another interesting thing is underneath the trunk mat you'll find a little hook. What exactly does this hook do? Well, if you pull on it, it opens up the trunk mat so that you can get to the spare tire and the car's tools. When you're done, just place it back and put the hook right back into its home. That way you don't have to get your hands dirty on the trunk liner, which is a good idea. Now, if you've made it this far in my Equus Tour, you're probably wondering what's under here, and that is a three liter V6. You see, when the Germans and the Japanese make a flagship luxury car, they put in a V12 or a V8, but the Koreans are more sedate, they're more conservative, and so this thing has just a three liter V6. Although, there was an optional 4.5 liter V8 if you wanted to really roast the tires, and that would be the front tires, because this car, despite being a flagship luxury sedan you can lie down in, this car is front wheel drive. By the way, another interesting quirk about this car, it was co-developed with Mitsubishi. Even though Hyundai is now this massive global automaker and Mitsubishi is basically on the verge of collapse, Hyundai used to not be all that big and they needed Mitsubishi to hold their hands when making a flagship. Mitsubishi released their own versions of this car. There was the Proudia, that was the regular one, the Equus, and then just like the Equus, there was also a limo version, but instead of just calling it the long wheelbase Proudia, they called it the Dignity, the Mitsubishi Dignity. There's a little trivia for you. With all this said, lest you think the Equus is some excellent premier luxury car, there are some interesting omissions. For example, Hyundai didn't bother to install a third brake light. Also, the car has no sunroof, even though it has two TVs and three cigarette lighters. And then there's the horn, which leaves something to be desired. So that's a full tour of the first generation Hyundai Equus. It's probably the only time that most North Americans and Europeans have ever seen inside this car. Now, when I was in Korea in 2015, these things were everywhere, mostly because Koreans generally only buy Korean cars, but I've never seen one outside Korea until now, and I've certainly never driven one. So now it's time to satisfy my curiosity and get behind the wheel. All right, driving the Equus. <laughs> It's weird, I've never driven the newer Equus, so I can't really tell you how it compares. But what I can tell you is that it uh, it feels a lot like a Lincoln so far. <laughs> oh God, and going over that speed bump just washes away. This car is tremendously comfortable. Sitting in here, it's actually very quiet inside this car. It's quite impressive. Uh, the steering is atrocious. I mean, it's just ridiculous. You, uh, I can't believe this is a 2002 vehicle with the steering like this. It isn't bad but it's so soft and vague. I mean, the vagueness of this is, is on a level that I haven't seen in a modern car ever. This car was just designed to be ultimately the most relaxed experience. And so the goal was just to make it this cushy, cushy vehicle. And that it is. One of the crazy things about this car, the, the design is so tremendously conservative. It's almost unbelievable to me that this car comes from 2002. Uh, the design just looks like something that would have come out of the mid or early 90s. But the Koreans, they didn't have a crazy sense of humor about this stuff. They, they, they were making a car that, you know, it was like the Korean culture. They didn't, it wasn't going to show off. It wasn't going to be crazy. The funny thing is it's also the embodiment of the luxury era of that time in Korea. You know, in the States, you get a full-size luxury sedan and you put a V8 in it, you know. Some of the, the V12s, S-Class. 
This thing has a V6. But in Korea, you didn't, you just, you, you didn't want to get excessive. You didn't, we didn't need to do it. You know, V12, eh, it's, that's too much. That's crazy talk. Sorry, I got distracted there. A six door Mercedes just went by. I love driving this car and looking out over the ridiculous hood ornament, like I'm in a Mercedes or a Lincoln and Cadillac from the 50s. But instead, I'm in a 2002 front wheel drive Hyundai <laughs> with a six cylinder. All right, flooring it here. <laughs> oh, well, it's not one I would consider to be fast. <laughs> I mean, it's not slow, but, but it almost is. Uh, it's not really quick. But that wasn't the point of this car. And the transmission is clearly designed to dull the experience as much as possible. Very soft, simple shifts. But I will say, although it is not at all fast, it's very comfortable. Sitting in here, the seats are very plush. Uh, it's very, very comfortable in this car. Uh, the leather is very soft. It's softer than Lexus leather at this time. It's sort of harder. The leather in this car is very soft. The seats are very soft. You sit in and it feels very nice. Uh, this isn't, this isn't a, a car that I don't like. This is a car you kill miles in. Uh, you know, you just sit here, you set the cruise control and you just kind of relax and hang out. So there you go. Now you've seen the original Hyundai Equus, the one they never sold in North America, the one they pretty much never sold outside South Korea. In fact, unless you go to Korea, I strongly suspect you'll never see one of these ever again, which is a shame because it's kind of charming. And now it's time to give it a Doug score. Starting with the weekend categories and styling, the Equus isn't ugly, but it's not really all that attractive either. It's just bland and it gets a four out of 10. Next up is acceleration. There are no published zero to 60 times for this thing, but it made about 190 horsepower and there's no way it was doing zero to 60 in under seven seconds. So it gets a one out of 10. Handling is fine, reasonably predictable and not dangerous, but almost laughably wallowy around corners and it gets a three out of 10. Cool factor is low. It'd be high if you knew what it was, but you don't. So it gets a four out of 10 and the same goes for significance. This is a significant car for the Korean car industry, sure, but the fact that you've never heard of it says everything you need to know and it gets a 4 out of 10. That brings the weekend score to a mere 16 out of 50, which is among the lowest weekend scores I've ever given out, but I mean, yeah, it's not a weekend car. As for the daily categories, starting with features, the Equus has some stuff that would have been cool in 2002, but it's missing all the modern tech you'd want and it gets a 4 out of 10. Next up is comfort, and this doesn't quite reach the level of Bentley and Rolls Royce, but it's not that far off and it gets an 8 out of 10. Next up is quality. The interior is nice, but it's no Rolls Royce and it's not even on the level of Lexus or Mercedes Benz. I don't know about reliability, but I'll assume it's about the same, a little above average, and it gets a 6 out of 10. Next up is practicality, and I don't have the exact number for cargo capacity, but the trunk is huge and so is the back seat and it gets a 5 out of 10. Finally, there's value. You can't get one of these in the United States, but if you could, they'd be selling for around six grand, and that's a lot of car for the money. It gets an easy seven out of 10, bringing the total daily score to 30 out of 50, and placing it in some good company near the 1991 Mercedes 560 SEL and other aging luxury cars like the Maybach 57S and the Rolls-Royce Silver Spur. Add it all up, and the total Doug score is... 46 out of 100, which is fine, but it's not a standout. But the Equus isn't cool because it's an amazing car. It's cool because it's a car you didn't know existed with a lot of features you've never seen before.